the show is here. Yo, our mission is clear. It's time to change healthcare. Have no fear. Today is the day. This is the hour. Together, you know we've got the power. Drop the silos. We're all the same team. Patients, docs, nurses, tech, and marketing. How can anyone be satisfied with the way things have always been? Yeah, we've tried. So join us now. Join the revolution. Digital health is the evolution. Status quo, more like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rap. Y'all, come on, let's go. Welcome to the healthcare rap, where we are ushering in the future of healthcare and the status quo no longer exists where we are challenging assumptions about marketing and technology, and we check yesterday's thinking at the door. Where truth drops like an atom bomb, and knowledge flows like Niagara Falls. Each week, we challenge assumptions that have been holding back healthcare marketing, and explain how we can do better. Join us. This is the Healthcare Wrap. Welcome back. I'm your host, Jared Johnson, ready to share some more provocative thinking about what healthcare could be. Here on the Healthcare Wrap, we believe that healthcare has to truly become consumer first, and we're trying to do something about it. We can either stand back and let it take another 50 years, or we can jump in right now. We'll get there faster together, so come be a part of it. Each week, we talk about building the healthcare of tomorrow. We're approaching 200 episodes in four years on the air. We're now in season six, where we're focusing on how to operationalize and scale consumer first healthcare and digging into the details of how to make it happen. So here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about how the gloves are coming off from big retailers, with Walgreens publicly stating that their goal is to keep you away from the healthcare system, and CVS Health now claiming to be uniquely positioned. Is it finally time to invest the human capital into understanding their battle plan? I'll talk about that. Then Dr. Matt Sabolsky is back in the house to share some provocative thinking about the important intersection between behavioral economics and digital health. We'll dive deep into the details of human behavior that impact digital health adoption and why it matters. This episode's jam-packed, and we have a lot to share along the way. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. The gloves are officially off. No more Mr. or Mrs. Nice Big Box Retailer. The escalation and candidness of the language being used by big retail, together with their record investments, are signs that, contrary to the hopes and wishes of those peddling a return to the status quo, they are planting their flag in the ground and planning to battle on an entirely different plane, keeping us from even needing to engage with the healthcare system in the first place. So much of today's talk about patient experience and marketing goes out the window if we don't need sick care anymore. The headline going around last week came when Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO Roz Brewer spoke at the Forbes Healthcare Summit and said that their multi-billion dollar push into primary care will, quote unquote, keep people from returning to the system of healthcare. That's right. They're investing billions of dollars to roll out hundreds of physician staffed clinics attached to Walgreens drugstores, as well as additional investments in post-acute and home care. In other words, if they get their way, fewer people will be needing to visit a hospital. And they're not the only ones. In the meantime, CVS Health made some bold claims themselves last week in their Investor Day presentation. One slide summed it all up to me of why they are putting so many eggs in their healthcare basket. Their positioning didn't mince words. They said, and I quote, Only CVS Health has this unique collection of assets, a destination and partner of choice for consumers in communities across America. 100 million aggregated healthcare lives, differentiated care delivery assets, meaning community, home, and virtual. Industry-leading pharmacy fulfillment assets, deep healthcare experience, a trusted brand associated with healthcare services, a proven ability to scale assets, and a demonstrated ability to assume and manage risk. Credit to James Gardner for sharing those slides. Listen, I started my career in PR, and I'm very aware that this is the tip of the spear as far as the hype machine goes. I understand that. But if you want to know where the market sees opportunity, you follow the money. And I struggle to put my finger on how hospitals and health systems can counter what CVS Health just said. What do you say in return? Okay, fine, you have 100 million aggregated healthcare lives and differentiated care delivery assets, but we're building more clinics. Come see even more doctors. Buckle up, people. The lines in the battleground are being drawn. This is the beginning of the war, not the end. But let's not lose sight of who ultimately wins if things keep going this way. You guessed it. Us. Consumers. You, me, our loved ones and neighbors. It's time to seriously take a step back and invest the time and human capital into understanding what retail offers consumers and then use that same understanding to design better products and experiences wherever your organization falls within a consumer's health journey. That's another way we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the week.
flow, the flow, the flow. Okay, listeners, uh, we've got a treat here. We've got a return guest. Uh, always a pleasure to welcome somebody back. Dr. Matt Sibolsky's we're back in the house here. He's going to share some provocative thinking about all things digital health, behavioral economics. You're going to ask me, what is that? We're going to tell you, and we're going to dive deep into where things are headed in these areas. Uh, but first and foremost, Matt, welcome back. Jared, it's always a pleasure to be here, and you're so complimentary of me, and I'm really pleased to still be in your community, so it's going to be back. Hello. Yeah, community is the word, isn't it? That's what we are seeing more than anything. You and I were just talking about that kind of in our show prep here. Community, the rise of it, the rise of the things that we are seeing and feeling collectively and the power of that. I uh, love that you mentioned that right out, of the, right out of the gate here. A couple of things I didn't mention, our uh, upcoming author, you got a book coming, and right. as well as being host of the Voice of Healthcare podcast. Uh, tell us about the book. Yeah. So thanks, Jared. Yeah. The book's been sort of this labor of love. And when is a book not the labor of love? What's interesting to me is uh, I think a Hemingway quote. He said, writing's easy. All you have to do is pull your chair up to the typewriter, sit for a second, put your hands on the keyboard, and then you start to bleed. And the project itself has been just that. It's barrier upon barrier. It's me featuring Q&As with innovative thinkers, scientists, physicians, creatives. I've got a few Grammy Award winners that are have contributed to developing tech for healthcare, believe it or not. Developers. I got patients that are involved, which, you know, to say that is to say as if not all of us have been the patient or the eventual patient. And other geniuses who are involved in making impacts in digital healthcare. I've got executives there and some folks that are even thought leaders like Brett Kinsella, someone that you and I both know and and kind of cherish his work. They've all contributed to this. And it's a, it's a compilation of their contributions and answers to my questions, as well as, you know, the answer to the following question, which was, if I was to ask you what you wanted me to about digital health so you could share it, what would it be? And I put that all together. I've pulled out the best parts and compiled it, and it'll be available on Amazon January, February. And I'm excited about that coming out. And the reason I'm excited about it is what you and I talked about before we hit record, which was, to me, if you're interested in something, you build a community around it. Businesses, success, momentum, Even movements require building a community. President Obama said with laudatory comments as well as critical comments from from the audience and the public, success doesn't come by yourself, right? It comes from not being by yourself. It comes from people who have mentored you or collaborative partners or support in many, many different facets. Even Rumsfeld, right? Donald Rumsfeld famously coined the thousand points of light right? For volunteer support, community services throughout the United States. I really believe in that as a theme of living successfully and doing something that matters. And to me, the book is a part of that. So is being in contact with you, Jared, in this conversation. It's amazing how when we start to realize the power of connecting these dots, connecting the the people in our communities, and then the insights that they each share with us, there is so much strength and power there. A perfect starting point for our conversation today, Matt, because we're talking about a couple of different applications of that in my mind and how community can benefit us as an industry. Uh, A couple of things specifically kind of areas for us to kind of be our launching point here, if you will, are the fields of behavioral economics and digital health and kind of where the two intersect. Let's start there in terms of like just basic definition of behavioral economics. So behavioral economics is really sort of like the synthesis and the intersection between what we know about sort of like outside human behavior human psychology and the brain. And there's a big part of that that's the unknown, which is, you know, all the intersections and the inner workings of the brain. But what we do know is how humans respond to stimulus. And this is non-neoclassical perspective. So this is the idea that we are not an all-knowing decision maker. We are made of habit. We are made of perception. And we are made of sort of these automatic decisions in response to what's happening around us, including what other humans are doing. So behavioral economics are really about decision making, whether it be conscious or largely not conscious. So in terms of how that helps us understand how to go about creating any type of application or program in digital health, one example I can think of is when I was tasked years ago Working for a health system, I was tasked with increasing the engagement rates, like the logins for a patient portal. 
patient portal itself got stood up and not very many people saw value in logging in. At first, it was like, people just need to know about it. The assumption was, it's only because people don't know about it. And as soon as they know about it, that it's there, they're going to log in and they're going to check it out and keep coming back to it. And quickly realized, yeah, that wasn't the case. <laughs> it was after a, a bit of promotions and typical things and, and some parts that I thought were, were done pretty well. You know, we did an instructional video with a customer service representative that walked you through it. And we did all sorts of, of promotions, really, if you will. And that, that incrementally increased the logins a little bit. Then that led to the conversation that I had wanted to have all along and I just, I didn't have it at the beginning and I should have. Let's back up a little bit and use a little bit of empathy. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of, in this case, is, this is a, a pediatric organization. So put yourself in the shoes of the parents. Why would they want to log on to this thing? And you're like, oh, well, to get your, get your lab results and this and this. Okay. How often are you going to do that? Well, I don't know. You know, like we just had this kind of like devil's advocate conversation, almost like a role play. And I was asking them, let's make sure we understand the value of what we're even asking somebody to do, because that is the main reason why somebody would log on or not log on here. And just going through that exercise, it felt like there were some elements of behavioral economics that we hadn't considered until we got to a certain point in this conversation to realize why would somebody do that and whether or not that's... It, Technically, in the field that you're describing, it felt like an example where we had to consider human behavior and why they would make a decision to do something one way or the other. So is that a reasonable example or what, sure. what elements of that sure. would make sense? I mean, there, there's really nothing in digital health that doesn't consider the human component, right? So, you know, activation of a product when you receive it in the mail, interacting with a mobile app to track blood sugar or calories, for example, why would you join something like Peloton in that closed community, right? The idea of the similar other and how that influences you. There is nothing in digital health that doesn't consider nor can be moderated by information and conceptions of the human condition and the human disposition and human psychology. That is a standard. So what you describe is absolutely the case. The impacts for digital health are immense. Default options, removing barriers, making things easy for people, comparing people to other people that they know or that they think are like them. These are part and parcel of the success of algorithms from things like YouTube, TikTok, et cetera. And they start to teach us after a while. But when it comes to utilization, satisfaction, habitual change, which is the holy grail of behavioral economics, not just a stimulus and a nudge that's short-lived, but this long-term change in consistent human behavior, this is all behavioral economics. It's all, it's all decision-making. And it is, uh, to me, the harbinger of success for the tools that we're creating post-pandemic and concurrently with the pandemic. Ooh, tell me more about that dynamic between habitual behaviors versus a stimulus and a nudge. What are, what are the benefits of that? Or, or, or why are we aiming for having a habit out of something versus just getting them to do something once? If I want to get someone to do something short term, sure, I can nudge them. You know, hey, this hallway's just been mopped. Don't walk down it. Okay, I'll just go down this other hallway. You know, really simple. Even though maybe the other hallway's got a staircase and I hate that. But habituation is like, oh, I'm going to take the staircase. It's good for me. And then it becomes sort of this thing that you always do. So a nudge, is it long-term? Is it short-term? There's debate, but habit is not a debate. But we do know that getting someone to change a habit, meaning they're doing it on their own, they're flossing their teeth, they're brushing their teeth daily, they're eating right daily. They've stopped you know, abusing their dependent substance on their own and it's consistent and they're not regressing. These are things that are the holy grail of human change and human optimism and success. Asymmetric paternalism, is the real like academic sort of uh, name for getting someone to do something that they don't know is actually good for them and continuing to do that. So nudge versus habit. You know, if we all had good habits, there wouldn't be a need for nudges when it comes to healthcare, right? I still would nudge people to make decisions that benefit me from like a sales perspective, right? That's kind of the nature of sort of capitalistic economies, right? Like I want people to, I want to create a need, you know, not and a want and make those interchangeable I feel like habit is somewhat similar to that, but it's a little bit of us looking through a lens of what do we know is good for human beings. So if we got to a place where people just had great habits, 
people like me wouldn't need to be around. Uh, same for you. You wouldn't be talking to me. But habits are those things like, uh, you know, you make your bed in the morning or you're eating right or you're working out regularly or you name it. And some of these habits can be great for us and some of them can be absolutely disastrous and calamitous. My goal when I work with groups of people or when I support people one-on-one -on -one or as teams is how do we get the targets, the, meaning the people, the patients or the providers in some cases, or over-the-counter retail? How do we get people to choose the thing that is a tripartite win? Business, and the patient and the overall good. Those three things. How do we get them to align and do so consistently over time? You know, I was reading recently, you know, to me, behavioral economics is innovation in human behavior, right? Innovation in human interaction. If you do your job right in innovation, you work your way out of the job. Because what you've done is you change the habit of culture of the teams you're working with to think innovatively, take the risks they need to calculatedly, record and measure what won over time and your role as an innovator goes away because the cultural habit has been established. That is true for groups, the same as it is for an individual habit. So there are books and literature written on these things, thanks to Thaler and thanks to Tversky and thanks to Kahneman and many others. So yeah, nudge, habit, at what point on the line from nudge to habit does it become a habit? up for debate and conversation, but great question, Jared. Hang with us. We'll be right back and check out these amazing podcasts from our friends. Hi, this is John Lynn from the Healthcare IT Today podcast. If you like the latest rumors, insights, and happenings in healthcare IT, you'll enjoy hearing my colleague Colin Hung and myself debate and share the latest happenings from the world of healthcare IT. Find the latest episodes or dig into our archive at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcast application or YouTube. When it comes to healthcare technology, we love this stuff. Of. And we can't wait to have you join in on the discussion of everything health IT. Ed Marks here with Digital Voices, the only podcast for chief digital officers across all of healthcare and life sciences. Digital Voices is about the voice of the patient, the provider, the payer, pharma, big tech, retail, public health, really any part of the healthcare and life sciences ecosystem, that's the digital voice we want to capture as we learn and break barriers across the entire spectrum. Join us weekly as we drop our pod. Okay, back to the flow. Well, there's a lot of application, isn't there? I mean, pretty much everything we start talking about related to digital health and the latest iteration of digital health, which looks a lot different than it did five years ago, you know, let alone 10 years ago. But the, the types of applications, platforms, content, anything that is being put out there and developed to, in theory, help someone live a healthier life. There's a lot of gray area, it feels like, or, or a lot of lack of understanding, I feel like, of, of behavioral economics, of just of kind of assuming that people are going to behave a certain way. Or even if they tell sure. you that they're going to behave a certain way to see that they actually don't do that. They, they said they were going to, but then they don't in real life. And those are factors, like big factors. They're the unspoken factors or just unaccounted for. And the more we understand this, the more we realize we're still dealing with humans who, who do have habits already created. They do have a view of the world and a view of how they make decisions. And we've got to factor it in more often than we're doing right now. Right. You know, I had a, yesterday, it was interesting to bring this up. Yesterday, I was having a uh, salon with one of my dear friends and contemporaries. He's a medical academic. He's actually working on building a new medical school here with a team of folks in Nashville. And, you know, I was talking to him about this topic. But one of the things that I brought up to him when it came to, you know, patients and digital health in our conversation was how pop psychology gets in the way of, you know, sort of effectual, influential, evidence-based outcomes that we're aware of. Now, what's really fascinating to me about behavioral economics in regards to this pop psych sort of 
let's pathologize everyone and normalize these things that tend to be rare and not common is the idea that psychology and behavioral economics doesn't always have to be high tech for a great outcome. You know, sometimes it's as simple as saying people named Jared tend to buy black jeans when they're in the store today. And you just go and buy some black jeans because your name is Jared. It didn't take a whole lot outside of some statistical research. There wasn't an app that was built. Nobody coded. No one, you know, joined relational data sets of men named Jared who are around your age. It was just something that was discovered simply and could be applied. A lot of that is true for digital health, right? It can be as simple as the color of the notification. It can be as simple as, you know, knowing that humans like to exist in communities and tend to respond to other people in their communities. I mean, to me, the valuation of Peloton is far beyond the bike, far beyond the treadmill. It's a group of people who are willing to listen and perhaps spend their dollars on things recommended to the larger community because others are going to be doing it. That is the magic of behavioral economics. Whether it's a community we want you to join, like CrossFit, for example, you mentioned. This is the magic, which is sort of the, the radical acceptance of what humans do and meeting them where they are instead of getting our shoulds and our morals all over them. If you can work with them where they are and how you know they exist and where they're influenced, we can get off the soapbox, we can stop slamming the gavel on our morality of what people should be doing with their health, and we can make some real ripples in the pond of well-being. That's the basis of those debrief discussions. Okay, hey, why didn't this project work? Why didn't this reach those KPIs we wanted? Why didn't we get the engagement rate we expected? And nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, when I'm involved in any of those discussions in, in the past, it's like, well, did we factor in that we're talking about human beings? Okay, do you think because you're in a certain age group and you're a certain gender and you live in a certain place that you're going to behave a certain way every time, like just based on that? Now, those may be factors. We're like, okay, so that's a good starting point. That might be the most likely thing they're going to do, but we can't blame them when they don't do that thing, when they don't log on to that thing, when they don't use that tool, just because they know it's good for their health doesn't mean they're going to use it. There's a big psychological disconnect in sure. understanding behavior. And then we get into those boardroom discussions of like, how can we do this better? And it's like, well, there's still an X factor because it's called we're human beings. Yeah, but there's no blame. What, what there is is responsibility. And the responsibility is to think like a scientist. You know, Adam Grant recently in his book, Think Again, talks about scientific thinking and how valuable that is. And, you know, Jared, what you're describing is sort of the celebration of a failure. Innovation doesn't happen unless you fall on your face a bunch and fail. You have to fail. And failure means that you've knocked out something you know isn't working. And the more that you pile up the stuff that doesn't work, the closer you get to what does. So always look at a failure and say, yes, this didn't work. We have a data point that we know is true. Failure is truth. And it's actually a joyous occasion when you fail. Failing happens a million times before someone hits a big home run. And that's the scientific way of looking at digital health too. So, you know, if you and I are working on a project and what we applied failed miserably, you know, instead of being yelled out of the boardroom, we should say, so we know it's not going to work. And so now that we know what didn't work and the deciles and demographics that it did not, here's where we're headed again to give it another shot. So, you know, failure is a celebration and resiliency is too. There's a personal story of mine that I won't give details on, but part of that story involved me getting as many rejections as I could so I could get closer to a win. And I feel that's true with building something that works for digital health. You've got to calculate and amass the rejections and the failures, because if you're not doing that and you can't see 25, 100 failures a month, then you're not really getting yourself out there and doing the work at all. I mean, these successful things we come across, you know, are novel because they're rare. So anyway, I, I see those projects that failed or a part of it that didn't work as being a joyous thing. Now, if you're on a contract with someone, yeah, they may not really be laughing a whole lot when they write that check again for the failure. <laughs> but I do believe that conceptually you can return to them and say, hey, this is what we collectively thought was going to work. And what we learned is it doesn't work, but we, we think we have a new hypothesis and let's go after it. So anyway, community is success and failure is delicious. 
I agree with just changing our hypothesis. When something fails, all right, you got a new hypothesis. You got a new data point. That is definitely how I live. And especially in the content creation and content production world, talk about just doing that like rapidly every day. Like, yep, that worked. That didn't. Thought that was? Nope, it didn't. And you had the fact of you're trying to chase algorithms to account for your success. Sometimes you're like, okay, you know, I'm just going to take a step back and and say, this is my way of connecting with the world and, and finding like-minded people who can help create a community that does get us to a better place. Okay. Well then that's the goal with content, you know, versus saying, got to have a certain number of likes or followers or th- th- those kinds of things. It, it, it's always one other factor in how we judge success and, and failure. So a uh, great way to kind of pull all this together. I, I think one, one last place I'd like to go here before we're done is to ask you any direction on, on this about how to apply what we just talk, talked about to understanding the new healthcare consumer. What should we be focusing on to better understand consumers' healthcare choices? New consumers, but same humans, right? And I would say the access and the pressures to where you get care are changing, but the consumers aren't. And if that's true, then there are standards and behavioral sciences that, you know, to me remain the same, which are humans are inherently lazy and they don't like barriers in the way. Humans respond to what other humans that are similar to them that they relate to are doing. And humans are, find reciprocity, meaning exchange of goodwill, irresistible. And let's work towards the habit, the gold standard of behavioral science habituation. I would leave you with that, that there's no new consumer. It's the same humans, just a different way of getting care. The last thing that I'll mention was, is a trend, which trends as well as you and I both know over the last three to four years change rapidly in tech. But those trends are what's available for observation with a consumer. I mean, the Apple Watch and the Apple interface has kind of changed that, right? Fitbit also changed that. My Fitness Pal, Teladoc's work, Lavongo's work with you know aggregated feedback from monitoring you know glucose, eight sleep. What's your heart rate variability and respiration rate and body temperature when you're in bed at night? The trend is humans having access to their data in visual, compelling stories, not being housed and hoarded, right? But being seen as a marketing game changer. And it's also a human behavior game changer. You know, awareness can change how you act. You know, my fitness pal has this really interesting feature. You know, after you finish a daily input of what you ate and calories and whatnot, if you say, you like click complete diary, it says, hey, if you did this every day, you'd weigh X amount at a certain time or If you did this much cardio, you'd have a VO2 max of X over this many weeks. Making the future present is a motivator. Data can show someone improvement and give them the reward in the present, which drives a momentum and is totally and completely intangible. To me, that's a wonderful trend. And I'm really curious about where it heads. I did a lecture once and I claimed that Facebook is interesting and Instagram is interesting because what really people are doing is not going in to see other people, but going into those to look at themselves. Same is true for digital health. They want to look at themselves. And that's the win. That's the foundation of all of this, isn't it? And it's it's so important for us to keep uncovering the layers of what we've built on top so that we can understand what people ultimately want and desire. That's at the base of what their choices are. Uh, so glad you uncovered that for us. What's the best way for listeners to reach you and get a hold of you? Yeah, go to the website, voiceofhealthcare.co. Or what I really love is interactions on Twitter. I don't know if that makes me perceive people perceive me as a certain way or not. But to me, the conversation you can have with Twitter with people across the world is just really something. So whether it's Twitter or the website, I welcome people to get in touch with me through LinkedIn, Twitter, go to the website, voiceofhealthcare.co and have a conversation with me, interact. I want to build community. I'm present and available online. I am not just a fancy picture. I'm a real dude. And I would love to interact, collaborate, and grow. So I welcome everyone listening to this. If you're this far into it with Jared and I, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. Well, thanks for giving us so much to think about in such a short amount of time. Stay safe, stay well, and and we'll be following everything you're doing. Can't wait to hear from you again. Jared, likewise, enjoy growing with you as well. And these conversations get brighter and brighter. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks again for listening. We hope you found some value in this conversation. And if you did, do us a favor and follow us using your favorite podcast app. Then tell your friends and colleagues about us. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. 
Healthcare App is a member of the Shift.Health Content Network. If you enjoyed this podcast, you're going to love the other shows in the Shift.Health Content Network. Go check out the latest show. In fact, it's called Hello Healthcare, hosted by Chris Hemphill. It's focused on people who are moving healthcare forward, how healthcare strategy relates to data and AI, and what you can do to create or demand a better future. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or at Shift.Health, where all 35 podcasts and video series are free and available on demand. Until next time, keep marketing forward. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thank you.